How y'all doing? So this is really going to be the final notes video from chapter five. Um, probably relatively short compared to the others, but I don't know, man. The other ones, it just, it, it made sense to lump together uh, the topics that I did and it took a little longer, so I wanted to break it up some more. So, so this one will be a little shorter. Uh, imagine if I had told all the stories in the video instead of in person. Imagine that. A little colder here too. I don't know what happened. It's a little chillier. I don't know why. Um, anyway, let's let's get to it so that this doesn't wind up being too long. I know what you're saying, Mr. Mon. If you would shut up and just teach us, then you wouldn't have to make more videos. What are you going to do? I'm sitting here and I'm bored. I, it's what, this is what I do for fun. So sue me. All right. So let's get back to where we left off which is right here. And we talked about cell reproduction, IPMAT-C, when, when that goes haywire, something called cancer develops. Um, these now are the, the few little odds and ends here at the end of the, the, the chapter. So we already talked in chapter three about why cells are small. Um, remember, it has to do with the surface area to volume ratio. The surface area is how much outer covering the cell has, aka how much cell membrane it has. And the volume is its inner, inner capacity, right? How much air is inside. Uh, and when you divide the surface area by the volume, you want a big number. Big surface area to volume ratios are good things. Well, if you remember back in, uh, when was that? October-ish? Um, small cells have a big ratio. Bigger cells have a smaller ratio. So... Cutting to the chase, the reason it's good to have a high surface area to volume ratio is because when you do, the cell is more efficient at moving materials in and out across its cell membrane. Moving good materials in, oxygen, nutrients, things like that, and more efficient at moving waste products out of the cell. So we looked at this way back when, and we saw how the small cell has a surface area to volume ratio of six when we calculate it. The big cell, even though the surface area is bigger and the volume is bigger, when you divide the two, only a 1.5. So bigger cells have a smaller ratio. And then, again, if you remember, it has to do with the fact that the numerator is only being squared, it increases by the radius squared, whereas the denominator, the volume increases by the radius cubed. So your denominator blows up and gets bigger quicker, so the value of the fraction keeps going down as the radius of the cell goes up and gets bigger. So small cells, more efficient at moving stuff in and out. Uh, this is just a reminder. This is something that I'm sure you've learned in grade school and middle school, um, this hierarchy of living things. Now I threw some stuff here at the beginning, how atoms make up molecules and molecules make up macromolecules, the big polymers like proteins, carbs, lipids, nucleic acids. Those macromolecules make up organelles and organelles of course make up cells right there's organelles inside cells well a bunch of cells of the same type are called a tissue multiple tissues that work together is what an organ is a bunch of organs that all participate in the same basic overall process make up an organ system and all the organ systems together make up the whole organism the whole living thing so if we take a look at here, you know, we have animal cell, plant cell, um, a bunch of the same type of cell here. We have some muscle tissue, maybe some, some stem tissue. These would be all uh, same type of cells, numerous clumped together. A bunch of tissues together equals an organ, like the brain, or a flower, or a leaf, and organ systems. So here we have the nervous system with the brain, the spinal cord, the peripheral nerves in a plant you know, the shoot, the stem with all the offshoots, um, the leaves and the, and the flowers, organ system. And then all the organ systems together equal the whole animal or the whole plant. So just a reminder of that, uh, which I, I know you've had before. Now, interesting, important question. Mr. Mott, you told us that mitosis was a cloning process, that the sperm and the egg fused to make the diploid zygote and that that zygote went through the cell cycle, IPMAT-C, over and over and over and made all the cells, all the billions of cells that are in our body. 
well, why do we have different types of cells? How do we have muscle cells and nerve cells and skin cells if they're all identical clones of the zygote? Well, what do you think? Take a minute, pause the video, exercise your brain, see what you can come up with. How if every cell in your body is genetically identical, how can they become different from each other? Hmm. I'm giving you time. This is the part where you should pause. All right, if you're back, hopefully you came up with cell differentiation happens. Cells become different, right? Cell differentiation is the process of cells becoming different. And here's the analogy I like to use. Human body cell has 46 chromosomes, right? 23 homologous pairs. Well, 22 homologous pairs in the sex chromosomes, which may or may not be homologous. There's thousands, thousands and thousands of genes located on all those chromosomes that make up your genetic code, your genome. And yes, every cell has, every body cell, somatic cell has those same 46 chromosomes. However, there's no rule that says every cell has to use every gene that it has. That's the key. Skin cells use certain genes and muscle cells use other genes and nerve cells use different genes. And so different cells using different genes can become different, can differentiate. And that's what happens. So the analogy is imagine that the entire set of genetic information, all 46 chromosomes, equals a cookbook of information, a cookbook full of recipes on how to make, you know, thousands of things. Well, every cell has the same cookbook of genetic information, but every cell doesn't use the whole cookbook. They just pick certain recipes out of the cookbook to make the things that they need to make in order to be a liver cell or a pancreas cell or a brain cell. So I like that analogy, the cookbook analogy. All the DNA a cell has is a cookbook of recipes and every cell has the same cookbook. But as different cells start using different recipes out of the cookbook, they start making different things, they start becoming different, they differentiate. And that's how we get different types of cells that are all genetically identical because they use different parts of our genome. So that's, that's a key concept. Uh, you can guarantee I'm gonna ask you to explain that to me in an open-ended question. Lastly, we have some cells in our body known as stem cells. These are cells that can give rise, that can differentiate into many different types of cells. Now, you know, the zygote is the ultimate stem cell because the zygote literally gave rise to every cell type in your body, even the placenta. So that's called a totipotent stem cell, the fertilized egg, the zygote. Well, as cells become different, they start to become more limited. And so we have what are called pluripotent stem cells as embryos that have already sort of committed to become a certain type of cell or a certain uh, type of group of cells. They can't become every type of cell anymore. And so typically these embryonic stem cells are called pluripotent. And then as an adult, we still have stem cells. Now these are the most limited. You know, it's like there's, there's adult stem cells, multipotent stem cells, we call them that could become say any type of blood cell or any type of uh, cell found in you know, connective tissue or something like that. So you may have heard there's controversy, uh, scientists experimenting and studying pluripotent embryonic stem cells, the same controversies and issues that come up when we talk about abortion come up with this type of research because in most cases, not all, these were potential human lives. And so again, there's the same arguments uh, against this type of research. There's been a lot of work done to use adult multipotent stem cells because those you could get uh, from a human bone marrow or even a blood draw. And there's ways of, this might not make sense, but making them go backwards, making them go from multipotent backwards, less differentiated into pluripotent cells that depending on how you chemically treat them can become almost any type of cell. So that research is ongoing. Now, the way I remember this is that totipotent stem cells, the zygote, can become the total number of cells that make up an organism. So totipotent, the total number. Pluripotent stem cells are a little more limited. So pluripotent cells can become 
pretty much any type of cell. See the P? Pluripotent, pretty much. And multipotent adult stem cells are the most limited. They can become many different types of cells, but not pretty much any and not the total. So again, that's not maybe the, the best way to remember it, but that's how I always remembered it. Uh, and so those are the differences between the three. Here you've got the fertilized egg, the totipotent stem cell, dividing into embryonic cells uh, that are pluripotent. And then these pluripotent cells will differentiate into all kinds of different cells. Um, and within each type of tissue, typically there are multipotent adult stem cells uh, for when we need to regenerate cells that were either damaged or, or died for some reason. All right. So that is it. So again, this one was a little shorter than the others. Guys, as always, if you have any questions, please let me know. Book some time. Shoot me an email. I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. See you in class.